Yes, we mm-hmm. are live now. So, hey folks, this is me, Vishwas Nair. I'm the host of this DevOps chat show. You know, market is not adapting cloud. It's the requirement that just started and now we are moving towards it. And I feel that there is a humongous requirement that we all came up with, right? You know what? There's this and that in the cloud technology and we want to talk everything regarding it. But let's just address the fact that what should we unlearn and relearn with respect to the security aspect, with respect to anything and everything that we are just going ahead and saying, you know what? We just want everything to be working as smooth as a butter in our entire life cycle and things like that. So I think it's a fair game what what kubernetes is playing with us it's just because we know for sure there is something good happening with respect to the kubernetes world and we know for sure azure has something which is architecting and pioneering in that way and thank you so much navin sir for being on the show it means a lot and even in here you can see the link which is popping up that's tiny.cc aks navin you can just hop into the live show ask your questions if you have any do the architectural reviews and you can go ahead with it and i welcome you sir thank you for being on my show means a lot thank you thank you so much vishwas it's always a pleasure coming on to a show with you you know it's just fantastic sure you know i know you have a lot of insights to share you have a lot of anti patterns that you saw and you want to say you know what this is not how you do aks in the world of microservices and service mesh i think Recently, I did a session on Linker in yeah. Azure Developer Community. Just go ahead, just grab that session because it's it's good for placements, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I know for sure there is a huge and humongous demand that's flowing in the world of Kubernetes, microservices, and the things like that. But according to you, what is Kubernetes? So. kubernetes when we talk about it you know these days it's one of the most buzzing words in the tech domain a lot of folks are talking about it people are working in kubernetes developers are working in kubernetes applications now are being designed keeping kubernetes in mind so kubernetes it's nothing just you know a it's an orchestration platform for your application so in our previous talks where we discussed that you know we have our microservices we talked about microservices how monoliths were bifurcated divided into you know tiny chunks and in order to manage those tiny chunks we have something called as kubernetes so kubernetes provides us that entire platform which makes it very easy and convenient for us to manage and deploy all our microservices keep a track of how our microservices work so it's a you know ginormous orchestration platform which is right now at the pinnacle of technology so all the applications right now are being designed in such a manner that they can be deployed on kubernetes the platform could be any it could be your self hosted it could be a cloud managed in cloud we have multiple providers so yeah it's one of the most promising microservice orchestration platforms that we have right now Sure. So, how have you seen the difference between a self-hosted and a cloud-managed cluster? So, what's the feature that it brings on the table when we think about anything and everything that is carried out through cloud? Uh, so, when we talk about Kubernetes clusters, we talk about self-hosted. We talk about cloud-managed Kubernetes clusters. So, when we talk about a self-managed Kubernetes cluster, as the word suggests, you know, whenever you're managing everything by yourself that's a self managed infrastructure or architecture in a self managed kubernetes cluster in a self managed infrastructure you will be owning everything by yourself anything and everything that is going on is something that you have designed is something that you are controlling you get that control you know what all components i have you the entire control plane in kubernetes is something that you manage in your self managed kubernetes cluster along with your worker nodes so everything falls under your domain you have to ensure that anything and everything that you are keeping there anything and everything that you're deploying is up to the mark is working as expected and there are no issues there so that is what a self managed kubernetes cluster brings in it undoubtedly brings a better control more control you know because i am setting up everything from scratch 
However, when we talk about our cloud managed and the cloud managed, all those complexities are gone. So in self managed, when we talk about yes, we set up everything, we have everything. You know, it's more controlled. It gives me more control because I am setting up everything. But on the same page, we get a lot of overheads as well, because right now in today's world, we won't be talking about one or two microservices that I have to manage or deploy. There are a bunch of microservices, you know, hundreds, somewhere even thousands of microservices are being deployed. And managing such a ginormous infrastructure is not a challenge. You know, it's not a child play. So you have to ensure that everything and anything that you are doing works as expected. You do not crash unexpectedly. So all those complexities do come in when you are working with a self-managed Kubernetes cluster. So you have to be very well prepared. You have to design your entire infrastructure, and you know that kind of takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. In order to save all those complexities. we have the cloud managed kubernetes platforms a lot of well known cloud providers are providing the kubernetes platform for us where we can focus on what is more important for my business to grow or for me to grow so that is my application and the components my application require so they will provide and manage the entire kubernetes control plane we have you know aks from azure we have aks from aws Kubernetes engine from Google, uh, DigitalOcean is also providing Kubernetes platform now. We have, you know, Oracle is also providing. So we have a whole bunch of Kubernetes services that are being offered to us by a lot of cloud providers. So that takes us all the complexities away. A layer of abstraction is added, so we don't have to worry about the underlying complexities, the underlying infrastructure setting up, making sure everything is functioning fine. I have to only focus on my application and the type of workloads my application will run on, so that I can be more focused towards my application performance and my application stability rather than completely getting bogged down by the complexities of my entire infrastructure so that is you know some of the primary differences you can say when we talk about a self managed and a cloud managed kubernetes cluster i think yes we are coming out with a lot of case studies with hybrid cloud so do check out our product the build piper because It took us a lot of experience of delivering solutions on microservices for different companies through our service wing, understanding the need of the R, and now coming up with a solution which Bitwiper offers. So do check it out, and of course, October is coming up, October first. A lot of open source contribution done from our side. It's being celebrated out there. So do join that. We'll obviously come with it. So. As soon as I gave out a event called as ETA Security, everybody came up because that's not a hot shot because everybody is now adopting towards the cloud managed clusters and a lot of things are happening in the industry. So I wanted your insights with respect to why is Kate so popular in the world of Azure and also what is it all about when we are seeing about and production use cases? You have seen a lot of those instances in in your everyday life, like. In our service wing, you you see a lot of customers using it. In our product wing, you see a lot of customers using it. Of course, Oxty provides you a lot of services as well. So you are known for DevOps, by the way. So, how do you feel the popularity of Kubernetes inside as you are making it more production ready? Like, what made it more production ready according to you? So you know the fact that makes it popular in its most simplest sense or you know most nuclear sense we have a tendency to go towards anything and everything that makes our lives easier so if i give a completely lame example in our day to day life you know we used to use bicycles you know uh, i believe most of the folks have ridden a bicycle so instead of walking we'd prefer going on to any place or our bicycle because you know it will give us more flexibility i'll be able to reach there on time you know it's more convenient for me then we got bikes we got cars so instead of using our bicycles we moved on to bikes and cars reason being they provided us more you know more control it gave us more convenience 
it helped me save my time i will reach my destination even faster so anything and everything that that providing us a better improvement on something that i already am having tends to get more attention and in turn will be more popular going forward same is the case with kubernetes in the cloud community so in azure we have eqs so whenever you are deploying anything on a virtual machine or a server cloud is also managing servers for you you know you are not liable to manage the entire hardware however when i have deployed something on a server i have to make sure that my server is up and running all the time my server's configuration are up and running i have deployed an application on a virtual machine in cloud <clears throat> let's say i have deployed one application and one virtual machine in azure the application is running fine going forward the application got more users now what do i have in my arsenal to support that traffic i have to spin up one more server i have to deploy my application there i have to set that server up and deploy it then my application would function as expected so i have this feature with me i have this convenience at my hand that i can spin up a new server but for how long will i keep on spinning up new servers at any given point of time at a certain given point of time it is going to become an overhead for me because i cannot manage hundreds of servers by myself that's the place where you know kubernetes kicks in kubernetes gives us such high level of control over what i am deploying when i deploy a microservice on my kubernetes cluster let's say right now the cluster is just a single node cluster my traffic increases i do not have to spin up or set up the entire server the only thing that i have to do is either increase my node count from 1 to 2 or enable auto scaling there and i'm i'm good to go i don't have to worry about anything so that level of convenience that level of control and the level of security because we have a whole bunch of components which we can incorporate with kubernetes in terms of security which makes our lives more easier and more secure when we are dealing with such high paced you know uh, application development in the market setting up a server deploying an application on a server used to take a lot of time now when i am moved to a much better and optimized way of microservices with in a few seconds i can get my application deployed no sweat and that is the usp of why you know kubernetes is such a huge name in cloud community and in all the cloud environments and aks is so popular even even once you did a demo in the build viper show you also showed how and our back can be really set seamlessly using a yeah, job portal and your directory exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you know so yeah like that's how it sure sure you had something to say like no no i was just you know building up on your point yes because you know that demo you quoted so yes we do yeah. have a lot of seamless integrations sure so where should a guy who is working or a team of developers who are working in the world of aks because that's a world by the way <laughs> there's key data integration dapper integration whatever you want you just do it that's a kubernetes cluster which is managed by azure you pay for them you have all the freedom to use it so where should the journey of security start in aks and how should we approach it accordingly see uh the journey of security security nowadays is something that pops into anybody's head first thing whenever you are talking about setting up any new environment any new infrastructure and i'm not just talking about kubernetes even if you are just starting up you are setting up a simple virtual machine the first thing that will come to your mind is my server secure is somebody setting out there who just bombard my server or you know just take that server away from me so security is something that is a very critical concern these days <clears throat> and that is why you know we are also seeing this evolved term from devops to devsecops so the security has signified itself as a complete vertical and now it is being used as a complete term so when we talk about kubernetes security security should come to your mind right from the beginning when you are setting up your kubernetes cluster 
so from the point that you are setting up your kubernetes cluster till the point that you have deployed your application the security journey is from one end to the other it does not start in the beginning it does not start at the end it start from the very inception of your thought that you have to set up a new kubernetes cluster so you have to be very very critical you have to think about how you are going to design your cluster because once you have your cluster up and running you know it's pretty much similar to you know when you are creating a big structure you know when you are creating a multi story building you know you have to make sure that all the components are right there in the place all the security lines all the security components in my structure are fine because once i have that multi story building up and running it's set up people have moved in i cannot just ask people to move out because i have to get the you know electrical lines fitted i cannot same is the case with my kubernetes cluster you have to ensure that your kubernetes cluster is secure from the very beginning so when you are setting up your kubernetes cluster we have the cluster level security we have to ensure that based on my use case if i'm setting my kubernetes cluster up in a production environment i have to ensure that my kubernetes cluster is private it is not publicly exposed not anybody in my organization even in my organization should be able to connect to my kubernetes cluster only the designated folks should be able to connect to my kubernetes cluster and for that we have our private cluster configurations enabled in kubernetes aks provides it so you can enable a private cluster or you can have a public cluster you have to ensure that you are using a private cluster we have private links so what private links enables us to do is it ensure the entire communication is in the internal network nothing is getting exposed out so we have to ensure all our the entire cluster is private nodes should also be private we should not provide access to anybody to our cluster or to our nodes because nodes are even more crucial because that's the place where your entire work needs should be done so that is the beginning of your cluster and that is the beginning of your security design as well you have to ensure anything and everything that you are deploying in your cluster should be secure from the very beginning till the very end i think yeah dns sucks i should say <laughs> that you know somewhere down the line somewhere down the line you are bound to <laughs> bound to have a compromise with that but yeah like for sure you need to configure it right i think yeah. even even if you go back to an up and spoke model or else any of the cell based architecture that we want to really talk like we want to allocate this much amount of performance if it doesn't scale up let's just move to a new cell like everybody approaches that you know i think that's a great way to uh, analyze and do a capacity planning as well because you can't pay too much to a cloud vendor who is giving you that cloud as well so Absolutely. think about it before you start experimenting with it get right with your architecture i think it's not about hub and spoke or anything but security strategies that comes into the picture so yeah, yeah i think i think you covered that but i just wanted to ask you what kind of security monitoring is available in aks because whole amount of complexity is going on behind people saying you know what there is going to be servers which is going to demolish the kubernetes and things like that but i but i arguably say that you know what your business logic can't work in three lines or five lines of optimized code so if you think serverless is going to be the next big thing sorry for that you know kubernetes is evolving by the way i don't know where it will reach at the end of the day hmm. and of course companies are coming up with it so with respect to strategizing with, the cloud agnostic aks because azure arc is also there so what kind of security monitoring is available with aks like how does it give us that kind of an flexibility with respect to the security actually because i don't think so there is hundreds of tools that you require because it's just an add on to your entire system but how to approach it in a lean and a mean form factor so you know when you talk about security monitoring so there is nothing to peculiar that you can directly attach with okay this comes under security monitoring so what you have to ensure is the components that you are using for your security are placed in a manner they that they can perform optimally so that you can analyze those components in order to see what all threats or what all malicious activities were being performed or unauthorized operations were being performed 
So for that matter, in Kubernetes, in AKS especially, we have the first thing is your private Kubernetes cluster. You know that completely blocks your Kubernetes cluster from the is outside. It, is it not available in any other cloud service providers? Like, how are they strategizing it? Because no, we no, have Azure no. Spark and those which are very similar to each other. Like, how is it all about when it comes to AKS? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, the other cloud providers do have all these capabilities. They do provide us to make our Kubernetes cluster private. So, you know, we cannot connect to it right away. We have to be in the network. So if there is any activity going on in my Kubernetes cluster, I know it is within the network. I am certain, I am sure that it is from within my network. It is not coming from the internet because, you know, as soon as you expose anything, on the internet, you are wide opening everything for various amount of threats and various types of attacks. So we have to ensure that everything is private, all right, for managing and for keeping a track of what is going on, you have to ensure that you have your logins enabled in terms of services that are deployed inside your Kubernetes cluster. You have the loggings that you can see. You have your, you know, service monitoring. You have your node monitoring. You have your pods and all the microservices that you have deployed in your cluster. You can monitor all those. And, you know, we have something called as, you know, log monitoring. So there we can have all our logs streamed so that we can see whatsoever is going on in my application, whatsoever is going on in my nodes. For the application networkings, you know, whatsoever, what traffic is coming for my microservice, which requests are going in, which endpoints are being hit. Because at the top level, we can have all those visibilities, you know, let's say I am having my ingress controller, I have the logs getting streamed. So I can check, okay, these are the requests coming in. Those would be my top layer requests. If I have to dig deeper on, you know, if there are any malicious endpoints that are being hit in my application, which are not something that my application supports. For that, we have service mesh. AKS provides the functionality out of the box as well. We have Linkerd, definitely, which we can deploy in our Kubernetes cluster to have a track of whatsoever and what kind of traffic is coming to my application. Also, AKS do provide this out of the box uh, service mesh functionality, which you can enable. So you will be having one service mesh enabled AKS cluster. Then we have Azure policies. So policy is a very, very powerful tool that you can utilize in Azure in order to ensure that level of governance and security, that monitoring in our Kubernetes cluster. So we can ensure anything and everything that I do not want is not happening. And if it is being tried on, I'll get those logs, I'll get that visibility. In our previous talk where we did the introduction to microservices, we did discuss this governance piece where we talked about enabling uh, policies in our Kubernetes cluster in AKS. And as soon as you try to deploy anything which goes against that policy, we will see that right away in our AKS, in our Kubernetes policies dashboard that, okay, there have been one or two malicious in, uh, activities which are not approved by this policy. So I think even are... distributed tracing also needs to be taken care properly because if you Absolutely. don't know where the service is breaking or what is happening, I think there is hundreds of languages that we build upon, right? You know, it's just APIs, so it can break at any Absolutely. point of time. You need to strategize that properly. That's why I'm we sure need to have is. that. Exactly, you know, that's why we need to have that inter-service communication enabled. So I know where my traffic is going. I know where my request is going. If I talk about, you know, I hit www.google.com, I know where it is going. It is going to google.com. But behind the scenes, which all APIs that google.com is hitting in order to give me the result that I want. If I am adding some unwanted character or unwanted endpoint in that google.com, where that request is going, which service or which endpoint is it hitting now because of which I get the 404 or 400s. So that is very crucial. We have to have that visibility in our systems. So we know if there is any breach or if there is anything that is going south, I have that level of monitoring. I have that level of visibility in my system that I can look into it and identify whether it is something I have to take care from my cluster or is it something that the application teams or the application level has to check.
or validate yeah i feel you know i feel you know to a greater extent you know not just dns even your sla certificates can give me a lot of information about your entire infrastructure because i just go for the cert.sh no tool mm-hmm. i just put it to me and i know for sure what are the different certificates which are allocated to it and guess what i can get inside your test environment because i saw a company which had test three environment open on this certificate and i was able to get inside their infrastructure with just some sort of an uh shodan scans and also a little bit more amount of digging down inside their infrastructure because they were still running on a ec2 machine and somebody had opened 22 core and that's very bad even if you do it in a test environment by the way mm-hmm. so i was able to get in i i did all the monkey business and, and it was a bounty by the way and it was paid once so i I I just figured out the way to come out of that because they knew me that I'll get in. So I think I think yes, that digital infrastructure. What you still have today attached to a DNS, you click on it. It's still the ASCII code which just gets in and out of an infrastructure. So my question to you is all about educating people now because I've seen worse nightmares when I got educated about Kubernetes because there's no end because. Yesterday in the future stack, I was discussing about what's the technique that is used by a company, and I was like, Comcasting this and that. I'll again ask him, and I'll just remember, and I'll just learn from it. But I still know for a fact that Kubernetes is not stopping anywhere; it's just evolving. There's going to be a lot of open source contributions, of course. Buildpipeline.io is coming up with a Kida as one of its own. Kubernetes even did one auto scaling as one of its own features right now. So stay tuned for that. We'll be coming out live in by this year with the production out there. So I wanted to know how to educate folks on the team of developers with the cloud managed Kubernetes, and also how should they strategize security with respect to availability as well as getting the right logging and observability strategy on the side because. anybody can do a ddos without you getting to know that you are getting ddos at the end of the day so how is it how should we strategize all these practices so when we talk about you know different teams apart from the team which is solely responsible for managing your infrastructure and security it completely depends on what role are they going to play let's say if i talk about i am the person who will be designing the architecture i will be setting up the cluster i will be setting up all the components i will definitely be having all the accesses which are required i would be able to get into the system and be able to make the changes which i require all right but i have to ensure there are a level of governance there is a level of security in place so nobody is coming in and going out of the system whenever the users network layer is something that comes in the very beginning which we talked about you know creating a private cluster creating that network level uh, level barrier so make sure we are not opening up anything or any random ports out of our curiosities because you know that will cost us so we have to ensure first of all when we talk about different teams we have to understand what kind of role they are going to play when we talk about developers for instance i know a developer at most in some of the organization the role of a developer is just to build the application rest falls under the hands of devops they build uh, they build their application they tell the teams that okay the application my build is ready now it's up to you you go ahead and do whatever you want to do okay they deploy it in some of the organizational structures the developers are allowed to deploy the microservices the developers have that level of authority that they can deploy the microservices however still i would not want them to make any changes in the cluster i do not want them to make any changes while they are working with the cluster if you are able to deploy it you should be able to deploy it that is it if you have a particular set of application we have the concept of namespace in kubernetes right so i'll make sure that they only have access to that particular namespace so if the person is still breaking something he or she is breaking it in their own space they are not hampering anything and everything that is running in my cluster because you don't want a call coming to you that everything is blown up and that is something you definitely don't want to hear 
So we have yeah, to. I, I understand. Know, yeah, right. So you have to. <laughs> I definitely don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what they? I don't want a page of you to come and say me. You just made the server cry. Absolutely. You know. So that is something that you do not want to hear. So you have to understand first. Before designing your security, before designing your architecture, you have to understand different rules as well, because you know people do have the changing requirements. You know there are some ever changing requirements. Okay, right now they don't want access. Design the architecture like this. We want, uh, you know, we want an ironclad architecture. Nobody should be able to go in. Nobody should be able to come out. You design it. Then turns out okay, these folks require some level of access. then you have to start scraping those things out okay now you can go in so you have to understand what kind of role they are going to play who all are going to be involved and to what extent are they going to be involved in the architecture so that you can place them accordingly okay he is a developer she is a developer we want to deploy the application we want to analyze some of the configuration details but i do not want them deleting stuff so i will ensure they are only limited to that qa is they don't have to do anything inside my cluster i don't want a qa setting inside my cluster because they do not belong there they would like to have a visibility on the system matrices they would like to have the visibility on my application logs that is something which i'll provide them i'll have my monitoring and logging solutions deployed in my kubernetes cluster i'll provide them the dashboard this is your dashboard Take over it. View all the logs you want. View all the matrices you want. That is it. Your business is not inside my cluster. Your business falls outside my cluster at the monitoring layer. That is it. So I should not be going, you know, going around and handing accesses to people. You have to understand what the role is going to be, so that you can place them accordingly and you can guide them in a better way in order to the functionality they are wanting to. Execute in your cluster. All right. If a developer just who have to deploy an application, I cannot just hand out the entire cluster's access to him. Okay, you can do anything that you want, just because you have to deploy one simple application in the cluster, because that turns out to be one of the you know biggest security breaches. Because you know anybody is coming in, anybody is going out, then we you know get some calls that okay this is not working, this has changed. Who has changed it now? Who is going to say that I have made the change? the only thing that you can do is just circle around people ask few folks that you know are having the access everybody and you already know the answer everybody will say no i have not made the change so the only thing that you're left with is okay we will keep it like this and now we are blocking the access that is something which we do not want to do because you know that is actually secure i don't think vpn is secure <laughs> you can't rely on vpn so see that is your initial level of security that's your network level security i am just blocking people from coming in you do not have access to my vpn you cannot get in i have access to my vpn i am already inside but yep. what level of access do i need i have all the accesses the only thing i want is to see the system i just want the system visibility why am i having all the accesses so these tiny loopholes turns out to be bigger security threats going forward so we have to be very critical and very crucial about what accesses we are providing into whom plus you know our infrastructure should be designed in such a way that we keep a track of the updates as well because you know i've seen systems where systems are way behind the current supported versions of that kubernetes cluster and that becomes a security threat as well as a reliability threat as well because my cluster is already 3 or 4 versions behind if anything breaks who am i going to blame it for if my cluster stops working i have to take it 3 or 4 versions ahead i don't know what sort of challenges i'll be facing directly updating it from you know a version 1 to version 5 directly that is something you should never do you should plan your cluster upgrades accordingly that you are regularly keeping your cluster updated because there are a lot of security patches coming in so it's not just the security will they need to host the servers if they are like will they will they experience some downtime if they adapt to a new version it's like how how do you standardize that in the production 
No, see that is one of the yeah that is one of the major advantages that we get in our cloud managed Kubernetes cluster. Whenever you are upgrading your cluster, that particular cloud provider ensures that you do not face downtime. And how it does this happen is you have your node pools, right? One by one, it starts upgrading your nodes. And it is not like the application those are running in that particular node are just destroyed. No, all the applications running on a particular node would be drained out to the remaining workloads. That node would be upgraded. The applications would be shifted back to that particular node. Then move on to the second node. So it's a rollout update. So they ensure that the services are not hampered whenever you are upgrading. But the important thing is you have to ensure when you have to plan your upgrade. If it is a production environment, it is always advisable whether they are providing you 99.9% .9 SLA uptime. You have to ensure you are upgrading your cluster at the time mm -hmm. when the traffic is the least. You definitely do not want anybody in your upgrade process raising a hand and saying, I am not able to access this or this is not working because while upgrading you, this is the last thing you want to hear that, okay, this is not working. How am I going to get in the system while the system is already, you know, uh, in an upgrading state, the server, my cluster right now is already, you know, getting through one big operation. I cannot just barge in and say, okay, let's make this change again. So it's always advisable either plan it on offers or the time is when you experience the least So always ensure you are upgrading accordingly and your cluster should be at least if not the end state, always it should be at N minus one. So whatsoever is the latest version, it should always be a version behind it. You should strive to keep it in that state. Nothing less, nothing less. You are, you are certain that, okay, if now I face any challenges from my cluster's perspective, I have somebody else to blame. I know now it is your SLA. It falls under your bucket. You have to look into it. But if I am not keeping my cluster in good health, then hmm. I cannot tell anybody that, okay, my cluster is not working, do something. They'll right away tell me first, get it upgraded. Look at your cluster for once. Got it. Sure, I think that's how it is. Production is too humongous, my friends. You know, you can't really lay on what is the potential of a service mesh, what is the potential. There are even instances where Jaeger is not scaling for many folks. Like, they are still facing that production issues because once you don't know how to strategize which port has to go where, what is it, and it's all basics. It's all Unix at the end of the day, which is now in this format of Kubernetes, Docker, you name it, whatever it is. But this is all still concepts of how to optimize the compute. And I think there's way more amount of knowledge that has to be delivered for every engineer who is doing that technology. And they are still learning. And I think it's great that you know there are technologies from Azure which are coming up and helping us a lot. I think thank you so much, sir, for sharing such great insights. You know, you have seen a lot of chaos through AKS as well. You have seen a lot of chaos which Kafka getting managed on a Kubernetes as well, because every any stream system that you talk about today, it's still going through some sort of a Kubernetes cluster managed to some Kafka or something else. It's still streaming. So I think it was great. I think if you if you if you really want to just learn a lot about Linker, do check a session in Azure Developer Community Bangalore. It's a great session by the way. You guys can just go and watch that session. And thank you so much, sir, for being on the show. It means a lot. So next show will be on UAVs, drones, you name it. Because we are now going through a little bit of software world with a touch of an hardware and edge optimization. So I think do join that. And thank you so much, Naveen, sir, for being on my show. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vishwas, for having me. It's always a pleasure. Sure. Thank you so much, folks, for tuning in. This is Vishwas Nayan signing off from this live show. 
meet you all in the next show bye i think one yeah. more factor that you need to be planned well is breaking changes in apis i think sandeep sir has joined okay let's just continue <laughs> I think one more factor. So, what do you think about this? Like, how do you think this this going to be a huge impact in the world of Kubernetes? Like this step. Yeah, sure. Like, you know, uh, the breaking changes. You know, there are a lot of changes, and as we know, things are in a rapid development mode. Every day, we have multiple builds going in. and yes i have seen systems where these rapid developments these rapid builds which are going into the production environment turns out instead of you know giving a new feature it is breaking what is existing things does not work so we have to ensure that whatsoever we are deploying in our production whatsoever is going in my production environment whether it is an upgrade or it is a change it has to be thoroughly validated when we talk about like we just talked about upgrading the kubernetes cluster keeping the kubernetes cluster upgraded so always make sure that you go through the release notes release notes are you know one of the very good places to see what is going to break and what is not going to break when you are going to upgrade your cluster because although there are security patches but there might be some applications that you have which may not be very well supported in the upgraded versions there might be some changes there so you have to see whether all your workloads are adapting to that particular change which is coming in after that upgrade because apart from security there are a lot of stability or minor changes that comes in with that upgrade so you have to be very thoughtful about it you have to go through the notes same goes with your applications whenever you are updating your applications you are you know deploying new releases new builds you have to ensure there are thoroughly tested in the lower environments that's what the lower environments are for the lower environments should be utilized to their fullest unless or until you are sure that okay everything is working fine in my lower environment i should not in any sense allow a particular change to get to the production environment because as soon as it goes it is there people people will start looking into it people will start using it and if something goes south it's not just you who will notice it bunch of people who are using your application at that point of time will notice it so you will not be telling anybody this is not working they will be telling you this is not working this is one of the things which you would definitely try to avoid because you know i don't want my end customer telling me okay this is not working the pen that you gave me has the structure but there is no refill in it i mm, have to true. ensure that i put that refill in got it got it i think that's all best practices you know it's all that culture you know there should be a team which which will be strategizing all these that's where blue team red team everything comes in but yeah devops engineers are absolutely good enough for that job so yes i think any ending note sir if you have any like you can just give it to us so see in the end whenever we talk about security you know there are a whole bunch of tools which gives you security from network layer we saw you know we have private clusters we have you know our network security groups in our application layer on the ingress level because whenever we are talking about kubernetes we deploy we go with ingress so we have web wraps web application firewalls that is something which you should see that you are definitely having because that will be protecting your applications so you know we, you can have any you know third party wraps you can have open source wrap we have what you say uh, Azure provides you with application gateway. So if you are using application gateway as your ingress controller, application gateway has inbuilt wraps. If you are talking about open source, there is a tool called Wasu that gives you that open source web application firewall, which you can incorporate with your nginx ingress controllers. So you know there are a whole bunch of tools that you can use, but it is you know that is my thought because there are a lot of tools. It is not always best to have all those tools in your environment. 
think what security benefit or what benefit they are giving your architecture, then plan and then incorporate the rules. Just because this tool is a security tool, I should have it, doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, that is not a very strong piece. You should understand your architecture, what sort of security it needs, and at what level security is needed. And then you should analyze, evaluate, and then incorporate the solution. Like I just said, you have uh, application gateways as well, which are providing your wrap, and you have Bazoo as well, which is giving you a wrap. I cannot just incorporate both just because both are giving me wrap, so I'll have two wraps. That is good. No, that is not good. That will simply make your life you know, much harder. So you have to ensure where all you require the security components and which security component will suit you best. That is the way you should go with it. You know, there are a whole bunch of tools and technologies right now. So at every layer, see what all security best practices you can follow. At the cluster level, when you're designing it, ensure your cluster is private. Okay, and at your network level, ensure that the network security groups are not having any random ports open. At your application layer, ensure that you know whatsoever DNS you are using, whatsoever domain provider you are using, you have a strong TLS SSL certificates in place. You are not using any dev or test certificates there so that anybody can crack open your application. All right, you have your WAFs in place, you have DDoS in place. You know, Azure provides a whole bunch of tools. You know, you have ATP, you know, advanced threat protection. So it gives you all that visibility from where the malicious traffic is coming, where the traffic is going on. But you should be able to place them well in your architecture. So it is a optimally secure architecture that you also know which component is being used for what. So it's all about you know analyzing and evaluating what's best for your architecture. I think yeah, I think all these things not note it down, keep it in your head. Just architect the right way. There's no right way, there's no wrong way. It's all experimenting. If you want, you want Graviton builds, don't worry. There is buildpiper.io. You come to us, do become our customer. So we'll help you with all the deployments and we'll, we'll help you with that journey as well. So stay tuned folks for future shows as well as a lot of things that is getting planned over a course of time. And there's a lot. And thank you so much, Naveen, sir, for being on my show. It means a lot. And I think it's a great session. This is Vishwas Nayan signing off finally. Thank you so much, folks. Thanks, Vishwas. Thanks for having me. End broadcast. Perfect.